Number 4 St. Louis, San Francisco, number 1522 To start off the fifth and final part of my list, we now come the 482 Mountain Type, number 1522, from the St. Louis, San Francisco Railway, or more commonly known as the Frisco. Number 1522 is one of 30 Frisco Class T-54 mountains built by Baldwin between 1923 and 1926. They were built for pulling heavy freight and passenger trains on the railroad's eastern and western divisions through the hilly regions of the Ozark Mountains. Throughout their years of service, these Frisco Mountains have become highly regarded by locomotive crews as they were considered true general purpose locomotives, being used for fast passenger and freight service and even on local runs. However, after the Frisco began experimenting with diesel locomotives in the early 1940s, the railroad began rapidly replacing steam with diesel over the next five years, between 1947 and 1952. By then, all steam locomotives were reduced to reserved operations in case of a sudden increase in traffic, until that eventually ended in 1956. By then, steam had been completely replaced by diesel power on the railroad, which also included their T-54 mountains. After being retired in 1951, number 1522 spent the next eight years in storage before being donated to the National Museum of Transportation in St. Louis, Missouri in 1959. The Frisco Mountain sat on display for 26 years until September 1985 when a new nonprofit group known as the St. Louis Steam Train Association selected the 1522 for restoration back to operational condition. After more than two and a half years of work, in April 1988, the old Frisco 482 returned to steam for the first time in almost 40 years and made its inaugural run between St. Louis and Decatur, Illinois in October later that year. For the next 14 years, the 1522 had operated several excursions throughout its second operating career. These included, yet again, the 1991 NRHS convention in St. Louis along with the 844, 819, and 1218, a doubleheader with Norfolk and Western number 611 for the 1994 NRHS convention in Atlanta, Georgia, and quite a few in the year 2001, one being the annual Burlington Northern Santa Fe's Employee Appreciation Special to Texas, and several more during that year's NRHS convention held in Old St. Louis. Now, technically, Frisco 1522 wasn't the first 482 mountain type to operate in excursion service, that honor going to Illinois Central number 2613 back in part 1 of my list. However, unlike the 2613, other than the fact that it wasn't scrapped, the 1522 is the first, and only, 482 mountain to operate in the preservation era. Interesting fact, in 1995, the 1522 was given a new Burlington Route 5 chime whistle, which sounded something like this. Much like Canadian National 282 Mikado number 3254, the sound from this whistle Frisco 1522 carried was also used quite a few times in different forms of media, most notably in the newer SpongeBob SquarePants episodes. <laughs> The 1522 continued to wear this whistle over the next four years, until it was changed back to its original Hancock three-chime whistle in 1999. By mid to late 2002, many different factors occurred that would eventually see the 482 Mountain Type retired from excursion service, such as rising insurance costs, flu failures, flues being the metal tubes or under the engine's boiler, and new regulations set by the Federal Railroad Administration mandating that all operable steam locomotives must have their old flues replaced with new ones every 15 years, which the St. Louis Steam Train Association was, unfortunately, unable to afford. There was one other factor that eventually led to the 1522's retirement. 
The story goes that in June of that year, during a board meeting discussing the locomotive's future, one of the owners of the Grand Canyon Railway in Williams, Arizona offered to bring the 1522 out to the railroad for that year's NRHS convention later in August. The engine would have operated on some of the BNSF's lines through Oklahoma, Texas, and New Mexico and once arriving in Arizona, it would have operated alongside the railroad's two-way to Mikado No. 4960, their former Lake Superior and Nishpuming 280 Consolidation No. 18, and another visiting steam excursion star, Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe 484 Northern No. 3751. However, the SLSTA's management believed that this offer was a way of manipulating them into selling the 1522 to the Grand Canyon Railway, rather than bringing the Frisco 482 Mountain out for a visit, thus leading to further arguments between the group and the National Museum of Transportation. The 1522 made its last runs on a few farewell excursions between the 28th and 29th of September that year, after which this Mountain of the Ozarks was retired from excursion service and once again placed on stag display underneath one of the large train sheds at the National Museum of Transportation in St. Louis, where it remains to this very day. The support cars used during the engine's time in excursion service, such as the canteen and crew cars, had since been sold off to other steam excursion groups, such as the Age of Steam Roundhouse in Sugar Creek, Ohio, and the Friends of the 261 based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Whether or not number 1522 will ever return to steam is a topic that rail fans have thrown back and forth over the years. If this engine is ever to return to service, it probably wouldn't be anytime soon, as its flu sheet is damaged beyond repair, it would need to have a new one, as well as new boiler flues, if it is ever to run again. But the possibility that this Mountain of the Ozarks could steam again is still there. If someone has the money, the know-how, the facilities, and the resources to get the job done, the St. Louis-San Francisco Railway number 1522 could have a chance to make a spectacular return to the main line. Also, just to add, number 1522 isn't the only surviving Frisco Mountain still around, as it has five surviving siblings, numbers 1501, 1519, 1526, 1527, and 1529. Number 3 London and Northeastern Railway number 4468 Mallard Kicking off the top 3 spots on my list is undoubtedly one of the most famous and fastest steam locomotives ever built. The London and Northeastern Railway's Class A4 Streamlined 462 Pacific number 4468, better known as the Mallard. Mallard is one of 35 A4 Pacifics designed by Sir Nigel Gresley and built at the LNER's main works at Doncaster between 1935 and 1938. The A4s were essentially a streamlined development of Gresley's previous Class A3 Pacifics, designed for pulling high-speed express passenger trains on the LNER's East Coast mainline up to an average speed of 100 miles per hour. The first four A4s, built in 1935, were built to pull the Silver Jubilee, a new streamlined express train named in dedication to King George V's Silver Jubilee, or 25 years of his reign as King of England. In order to fit the new express train, the first four A4s were painted silver, as well as given names with the word silver. These being Class Pioneer No. 2509, Silver Link, 2510, Quicksilver, 2511, Silver King, and 2512, Silver Fox. During a press run that publicized the new service, Silver Link managed to achieve a top speed of 112.5 miles per hour, breaking the British speed record and managing an average speed of up to 100 miles per hour. The Silver Jubilee soon proved to be a commercial success, not only leading to other streamlined trains introduced around that time, including the London Midland and Scottish Railway's Coronation Scott mentioned back in Part 4, but also the remaining 31 A4s built over the next three years. Over time, the A4 Pacific soon became the flagship engines for the LNER as they handled top-link high-speed express trains between London's King's Cross via York to Newcastle, then later King's Cross via Newcastle to Edinburgh in Scotland. And that's where they stayed throughout their careers on the LNER and later British Railways following nationalization in 1948. 
numbering for the A4s was even more confusing than that of the V2 Prairies I talked about back in Part 2. The first four engines mentioned earlier, built between September and December of 1935, were numbered 2509 to 2512. The next 17, built between December 1936 and October 1937, were numbered 4482 to 4498. The next eight A4s, built between December 1937 and August 1938, which also happens to include the subject locomotive in this spot, were numbered 4462 to 4469. The next two, built in April 1938, were numbered 4499 to 4500, and the final batch of four, built between May and July 1938, were numbered 4900 to 4903. Yeah, as you can see, numbering for Grizzlies LNER Pacifics were a bit all over the place. However, in 1946, as part of the LNER's renumbering policy, as orchestrated by Grizzlies' successor, Edward Thompson, the A4s were simply renumbered 1 to 34. Why not 1 to 35 since there were 35 A4s built, you may ask? We'll get to that a bit further in this spot. Then finally, following nationalization in 1948, the A4s were renumbered again, having the number 6000 added to their cab numbers along with all other former LNER engines, being renumbered 6001 to 60034. On July 3rd, 1938, A4 number 4468, Mallard, would cement its place in railway history when this Dreamline Pacific was used for a special braking test on the East Coast Main Line, more specifically Oberstoke Bank south of Grantham. For this test, Mallard was coupled up to a seven-car train, which included a dynamometer car fitted with measuring equipment to record the engine speed. Mallard was only about four months old when it was chosen to make this particular run, in which the engine was still relatively new, yet run in enough to take on such a task. Mallard managed an average speed of 75 miles per hour by the time it reached the top of Stoke Bank, then once it started going downhill, its speed increased rapidly each mile down from the summit. Eventually, between the stations of Little Bymouth and Essendine, Mallard managed to achieve a top speed of 126 miles per hour, not only making it the fastest steam locomotive in the world, but also beating the previous record of 124.5 miles per hour, sent by the German-built DRG Class 05 Streamlined 464 Hudson, or Baltic, number 05002, back on May 11, 1936. However, Mallard's record-breaking run didn't completely go off without a hitch. One thing Sir Nigel Gresley was best known for was designing steam locomotives equipped with three cylinders, with the conventional Walshart's valve gear on the outside and Gresley's own conjugated valve gear connected to the center internal cylinder beneath the boiler. While the center valve gear did work pretty well and even made its way into a few overseas designs, Mallard's record run did show that it can go wrong if it didn't receive the specific attention it required during servicing. In fact, when the engine broke the world speed record for steam, the big end bearing of the center running gear had melted. Also, to make this record run even more risky, yet legendary, it was discovered sometime afterwards that some parts of the line the A4 had made its run on had not been replaced since 1910. So, to sum it all up, this locomotive was pushed beyond its breaking point, reached 126 miles per hour, damaged part of its conjugated valve gear, ran on parts of the main line that were almost 30 years old, and it didn't even derail. I have to agree with what both Chris's and Jim Vanderkolk said in their videos, that Grezzi's Class A4 Pacifics were definitely well-engineered first-class machines. Fortunately, the damage Mallard had sustained from its record-breaking run wasn't enough to put the engine out of service for good, and the Streamline Pacific was repaired at Doncaster Works and placed back in the service soon after continuing the pulled Top Link Express trains along with the rest of its fellow A4s during its time in service on the LNER, then later for British Railways in 1948. Following the formation of BR, Mallard was one of seven A4 Pacifics that took part in the 1948 Locomotive Exchange Trials, which involved having locomotives from the Big Four being transferred to other regions outside their own, so as to decide the best qualities from each region, which helped lead to the development of the BR standards in 1951. 
For its trial, MAUD was one of three A4 Pacifics tried out on the route between London's Waterloo Station and Exeter in the southern region, the other two Gresley streamlined engines being No. 60003, Seagull, and No. 60034, Lord Farringdon. However, Mallard's trials didn't exactly go all that well, and as soon as its trials were over, the famous A4 soon returned to the eastern region, where it continued its usual work on top lake express trains between London and Edinburgh along with its fellow classmates over the next 15 years. But despite the speeds and performance of the A4s during their time in service, unfortunately, they were simply unable to outrun their inevitable fates. These streamlined Pacifics soon found themselves under threat following the introduction of the BR Class 55 diesel locomotives, otherwise known as the Deltics, which had been built primarily to replace Gresley's racing thoroughbreds. Withdrawal of the A4s began in late December of 1962, with the first five engines being placed in dead storage at Doncaster Works, the very place where they were built, and subsequently cut up for scrap the following year. Among the first five A4s to be withdrawn and scrapped was class pioneer Silver Link. Withdrawal for the class continued over the next three years until the final six A4s still in service were inevitably retired in September 1966. However, one A4 ended up being scrapped long before the end of steam on BR. In fact, sometime even before BR came to be in 1948. On April 29, 1942, A4 number 4469, Sir Ralph Wedgwood, originally named Gadwall until 1939, received extensive damage during the infamous Baedeker Blitz bombing raid on York. The engine was sitting inside York Station, waiting to depart with the Night Scotsman, when the air raid sirens went off and everyone inside the station, the passengers, the staff, and the engine crews all fled for the safety of the bomb shelters leaving the A4 the fend for itself. During the air raid, one bomb was dropped to the station roof and exploded very close to number 4469, destroying the station and severely damaging the engine. Sir Ralph Wedgwood did manage to be salvaged and towed back to Doncaster shortly after the air raid. However, the engine was deemed damaged beyond repair and subsequently scrapped. Hence why renumbering for the A4s went from 1 to 34 instead of up to 35 later on in 1946. The fallen A4's name then went to classmate number 4466, originally named Herring Gull, two years later in 1944. Upon being withdrawn from service on April 25, 1963, Mallard became a very easy pick for preservation. Almost immediately after being withdrawn from regular service, the engine was transported to Doncaster and restored to its original appearance as LNER number 4468, after which it was then put on stag display at the Museum of British Transport in Clapham until 1975, when the A4 joined the rest of the collection at the National Railway Museum in York, where it remains one of the museum's prized exhibits to this day. Of course, Mallard isn't the only Grizzly A4 Pacific still around. Much like Frisco 1522 in the previous spot, there are five other surviving A4s in preservation, those being number 4464, Bittern, number 4488, Union of South Africa, originally named Osprey, number 4489, Dominion of Canada, originally named Woodcock, Number 4496, Dwight D. Eisenhower, originally named Golden Shuttle, and finally, number 4498, named after the class's designer himself, Sir Nigel Gresley. In fact, Sir Nigel Gresley has most recently returned to service after its most recent overhaul earlier this year, currently painted in LNER wartime black. Also, unlike the four other surviving A4s, Dominion of Canada and Dwight D. Eisenhower have been preserved overseas across the Atlantic in separate museums in North America, with Dominion of Canada on stag display at the Canadian Railway Museum or Expo Rail in St. Constant, Quebec in Canada, and Dwight D. Eisenhower residing at the National Railroad Museum in Green Bay, Wisconsin in the United States. During the mid-1980s, Mallard was restored back to operational condition by the Friends of the National Railway Museum for the upcoming 50th anniversary of its famous speed record run, making its first run since being withdrawn from BR between York and Doncaster on March 26, 1986. 
The A4 Pacific would only see about two years of mainline service, but even though its return to steam only lasted for such a short time, it still made quite an impressive sight as it operated a series of special rail tours across the UK throughout the years 1986 and 1987. Mallard's final run took place, appropriately enough, on July 3, 1988, exactly 50 years since the engine made its famous 126 mile per hour speed record run all the way back in 1938. Since then, Mallard has remained on stag display in its home at the National Railway Museum, sitting alongside its former rival. LMS Coronation Pacific No. 6229, Duchess of Hamilton, which I also talked about back in Part 4. But even in its second retirement, this A4 has still seen quite a bit of activity, being put on display during a few special events. In July 2008, Mallard was brought out to the NRM's Locomotion Museum in Shieldon, where it was reunited with three of the five surviving A4s preserved in the UK. While this little gathering was pretty impressive at the time, it would pale in comparison five years later, when between 2012 and 2013, all six preserved LNER Gresley A4 Pacifics were all gathered together for the first time in decades, in commemoration of the 75th anniversary of Mallard's famous 126 mile per hour speed record run. As well as England's three other resident A4s, this once-in-a-lifetime reunion also included bringing back the Dominion of Canada and Dwight D. Eisenhower straight from their respective museums overseas in Canada and the US. During that time, all six preserved Gresley Streamline Pacifics sat proudly together on display at both the NRN's museums in York and Shieldon until the event came to a close and the Dwight D. Eisenhower and Dominion of Canada were returned to their museums back in North America. Since then, Mallet has rarely been outside of the NRM's main museum. The last time the A4 was let out was when it was put on display at York Station a few years ago back in July 2019. It's completely unknown if this streamlined steam engine will ever be brought back to service again, but even though its return to steam was relatively short, Mallard is still one locomotive that has been recognized the world over, and its unbroken speed record for steam locomotives will continue to secure its place as one of the most famous steam locomotives in the world. Number 2 Union Pacific Heavy Challenger number 3985. Coming in at the number two spot is one of the largest steam locomotives ever to operate in the preservation era, and once even held the title as the world's largest active steam locomotive, the Union Pacific Railroad's 4664 Heavy Challenger number 3985. Now, before you start bombarding down in the comments section as to why this locomotive didn't make the number one spot on my list, please remember that this is my opinion. Just because I put the Challenger in the number two spot, it doesn't mean I like this engine any less than the one I have at number one. In fact, none less than any of the other steam engines in my list overall. I still think the 3985 is an incredible machine and the history behind this particular engine is pretty fascinating, and I am just as excited about the latest news on this engine, which I won't get into until further in this spot so as to not give away spoilers. It's just that the locomotive I have chosen for the number one spot goes there due to my own personal reasons on it. So without any further ado, let's get into this true Last of the Giants. Like number 3967, way back in part 1, number 3985 was one of 65 heavy challengers built by Alco between 1942 and 1944, with the 3985 in particular being built in July 1943, and were classified as the 4664-1s, 2s, and 3s. These engines were also referred to as the late or even the Jubelmon Challengers after their designer, Otto Jubelmon, the railroad's vice president of research and mechanical design at that time. Jubelmon was also the one who designed the railroad's famous and iconic 4000 class, or 4884 class, 4884s in 1941, best known to everyone, be they rail fans or not, as the big boys the largest steam locomotives ever to be built. 
In fact, Jobelmon had based a design for his heavy challengers on that of the big boys, hence the similarities in looks and design between the two engines, and this earned him the nickname of Big Boy's Little Brother. However, the heavy challengers weren't necessarily the first 4664 challengers to be built for Union Pacific. Before the Heavy Challengers, and even before the Big Boys, the railroad's first 40 Challengers were built by Alco back in 1936 and were classified as the CSA-1s and 2s. They also became known as the Early or Light Challengers, but these earlier articulated engines were also referred to as the Fetter Challengers after their designer Arthur J. Fetter. The design and operating careers of these engines did eventually lead to the development of the Big Boys in 1941, which also led to that of the Heavy Challengers the following year. So, with both the light and heavy variants, Union Pacific had a total of 105 4664 Challengers. However, 99 out of all these engines actually operated for the UP, as 6 of the heavy Challengers ended up being sent to the Denver and Rio Grande Western Railroad by the War Production Board shortly after being built. I'll go a little more into these 6 Challengers a bit later. Much like the big boys before them, the heavy Challengers were built primarily for freight service. However, some of these large locomotives also saw service on a few passenger trains as well, therefore making them the largest dual service, or mixed traffic, locomotives ever built. However, like most of the other Challengers, number 3985 only saw work in freight service, powering several freight trains throughout the Union Pacific system, including over the steep grades of Sherman Hill in Wyoming and Utah's Wasatch Mountains. The Challengers would later be downgraded to Helper, or Banker Service, during the twilight years of steam on the UP, when diesels began to take over much of their work. Eventually, once diesels had taken over all work from the steam engines completely, all of Union Pacific's Challengers were retired and scrapped between 1952 and 1962. However, not quite all of these giants ended up meeting the same fate. After pulling its last revenue freight train in 1957 and being officially retired in 1962, rather than being scrapped like most of its siblings, Heavy Challenger number 3985 was placed in storage inside the railroad's roundhouse in Cheyenne, Wyoming, along with Big Boy number 4023. It's unknown exactly why both of these giants were placed in storage, though one theory says that they were kept in case of a sudden increase in freight traffic most notably that of wartime materials if the Cold War suddenly turned hot and full-on war with the Soviet Union broke out. While this thankfully never happened, this actually held both locomotives to make it into preservation. Big Boy 4023 was moved from place to place until eventually making its way to its current home on stag display in Kennefick Park in Omaha, Nebraska. As per Challenger 3985, it remained in Cheyenne, being placed on stack display in the parking lot of the decommissioned Union Pacific Passenger Depot in 1975. At this point, number 3985 was one of only two 4664 Challengers still in existence, its only surviving sibling being fellow UP Heavy Challenger number 3977, on stack display in Cody Park in North Platte, Nebraska since 1968. The 3985 remained on stag display close to the station for about four years, until a group of Union Pacific employees and volunteers had the engine moved into the roundhouse, with the goal of having the Mammoth machine restored to operational condition and run an excursion service alongside the living legend itself. FEF-3-484 Northern number 844 which have been temporarily renumbered to 8444 due to a diesel locomotive with the same number being in service at the time. The Challenger's restoration took about two years to complete, but eventually, in March 1981, the 3985 was steamed up for the first time in almost 20 years, becoming, at the time, the largest active steam locomotive in the world as well as the most powerful until Norfolk and Western number 1218 was brought back to service six years later in 1987. The massive Union Pacific locomotive made its first trip a few months later in May of that year out to Sacramento, California, along with the A44 to attend Rail Fair 1981, held to celebrate the grand opening of the California State Railroad Museum. 
The 3985 would also make a couple more trips out to Sacramento along with the 844. The second trip being 10 years later in 1991 for Railfair 91 for the 10th anniversary of the CSRM, which also included the 1890 build Union Pacific 46010 wheeler number 1243 on a flat car, and the third one in 1999 for Railfair 99, held as part to celebrate the Susquehannock or 150th anniversary of California statehood and the legendary California Gold Rush back in 1849. In fact, following the conclusion of the third trip to California, the 3985 had to pull both the 844 and their entire train all the way back to Wyoming after the large UP Northern had suffered a flu failure during the event. However, since the 3985 still burned coal at that time, its operating range was pretty limited, with its first trip out to California being the only exception. Due to gradual rising prices in coal, the lack of infrastructure for such engines, having long since been torn down after the end of the steam age, and the occasional lineside grass fires caused by hot ash and sparks expelled from the engine's twin smokestacks, or double chimney. Fortunately, this was solved nine years later in 1990, when the Challenger was converted from coal to recycled fuel oil. This proved to be a very wise choice, as it eliminated the risk of grass fires, made the articulated engine a bit cleaner, reduced operating costs, and most of all, greatly increased its operating range, allowing the massive locomotive to travel much further throughout the Union Pacific system. Since its conversion to oil burning, number 3985 has operated a number of other excursions over the next 20 years, including its second and third trips to the California State Railroad Museum in 91 and 99. Other excursions the large Challenger has done over the years include one down to Topeka, Kansas in 1992 to take part in Topeka Railroad Days, along with the recently restored Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Northern number 3751, and one through Cajon Pass along with Union Pacific's preserved EMD E9 ABA diesel set during its 1994 tour. Throughout its excursion career, the 3985 has also gained itself the title as the King of Masquerades, having been cosmetically dressed up as three other Challenger locomotives. The first one was in November 1992, when the massive engine was chosen to pull that year's Clinchfield Santa Train. For this special holiday excursion, the 3985 was re-lettered and renumbered into the Clinchfield number 676. Remember those six heavy challengers that were sent to the Denver and Rio Grande Western after being built? Well, after serving the Rio Grande for about four years, they were then sold to the Clinchfield Railroad in 1947, where they were renumbered 670 to 675 and reclassified as the E3s. They ran in freight service for the Clinchfield until their retirement in 1953. So during its Santa Train excursion in 1992, the 3985 was renumbered to number 676, which would have been the next Clinchfield Challenger if they received more. Its next masquerade was one year later in 1993, when the engine dressed up as its fallen sibling number 3985, the very first locomotive I talked about way back in part one of my list. For the 40th anniversary of the Rocky Mountain Railroad Club's 1953 excursion between Cheyenne, Wyoming and Denver, Colorado, which was also the very first steam excursion operated by the Union Pacific. This little dress-up included having the 3985 being fitted with a replica number plate, as well as a pair of Elephant Ear smoke deflectors to make it look more accurate to the original number 3967. With the exception of the fact that 3985 had been converted to burn oil three years earlier, while the original 3967 burned coal. Number 3985 would also dress up as the 3967 again for the 50th anniversary 10 years later in 2003. During that same 1993 excursion, for its third and final masquerade, the 3985 was renumbered again to number 3718 for a what if scenario. What if number 3985 had been converted to burn oil back during the steam age? 
You see, between 1945 and 1952, Union Pacific had converted 18 of their heavy challengers, numbers 3930 to 3937 and 3975 to 3984 to be precise, from burning coal to oil. So in order to identify them as oil burners, the railroad had them renumbered in the 3700 series. So numbers 3930 to 3937 became numbers 3700 to 3707, and numbers 3975 to 3984 became numbers 3708 to 3717. So, if number 3985 had been converted to burn oil along with its 18 siblings back then, it would have carried the number 3718, and this is the number it wore during its return trip from Denver to Cheyenne. When Steve Lee, the man in charge of the Union Pacific Steam Program at the time, was asked the reason for this renumbering, he gave this legendary answer. We always wanted to run a triple header. <laughs> Aside from pulling scheduled excursion trains, occasionally number 3985 also went back to its original roots, pulling long, heavy freight trains. Probably its most famous freight run during its second career took place in 1990, shortly after its conversion to oil burning, when this 4664 Challenger hauled a 143 car long double stack train weighing up to 7,600 tons between Cheyenne, Wyoming and North Platte, Nebraska. This run definitely shows the true power and might of steam locomotives, even in this day and age. 3985 made its last run in October 2010, where the large articulated locomotive was chosen to pull the Ringling Brothers and Barterman Bailey Circus train from Cheyenne to Denver, where the circus put on a special show to celebrate the 200th birthday of P.T. Barnum the man who founded the circus way back in 1871, and even made a circus the very first to be transported by train the following year in 1872, thus leading to the creation of the concept of the circus train. Following its run with the circus train, the 3985 was brought back to the Union Pacific Steam Shops in Cheyenne for a much needed FRA mandated 15 year overhaul. After operating both excursion and freight trains for almost 30 years since its return to steam back in 1981. Around that same time, Steve Lee had retired as manager of the steam program, and his successor, Ed Dickens, took over his position. After being taken out of service, the Union Pacific Steam Team had planned to disassemble the Challenger and give it a full restoration back to steam again. But as they began the locomotive's disassembly, they were shocked from what they found. One problem after another was discovered the board the engine was disassembled, and soon there was practically a whole mountain of mechanical issues found within the 3985. It was later found out that when the previous steam team had restored the articulated engine back during the late 70s and early 80s, they didn't give it a complete full restoration as they should have, mainly having work done on the boiler and running gear to get it back in steam as soon as possible. In addition, the nearly 30 years of running excursion trains up to 75 miles per hour, as well as heavy freight runs, along with a few patch repair jobs in between, had taken their toll on the massive machine. And if that wasn't bad enough, Union Pacific's method of firing up their engines by pumping hot steam into their boilers also played a hand in further hampering the large Challenger's condition. While this was much faster than simply waiting hours for the fire to gradually boil water inside the boiler, this also increased metal fatigue. With all these factors in mind, the 3985 had become crippled so badly that it was no longer safe to operate. As the number of problems discovered in the locomotive kept on piling up, so did the price tag for a full restoration back to operational condition, leading up to a staggering cost of $8 million. Because of all this, Union Pacific would need to invest in a ton of manpower and funds if they were ever to get the 3985 back up and running again. However, before they were able to reach the necessary amount needed for the challenge's restoration, the steam team had then shifted their focus on their latest and most ambitious project, the full restoration of Big Boy number 4014 back to operational condition. 
This, of course, started with having the giant moved out of the Rail Giants Train Museum in Pomona, California back in 2013, then transporting it all the way out to the steam shops in Cheyenne, Wyoming in 2014. And then there was the extensive restoration itself to have this gigantic locomotive ready by May 2019, in time for the 150th anniversary of the Golden Spike Ceremony, which was originally held at Promontory Summit in Utah back on May 10, 1869, to celebrate the completion of the first transcontinental railroad. In the meantime, the 3985 was placed in storage inside one of the reserved remaining stalls of the old Cheyenne Roundhouse, albeit detached from its tender due to there not being enough room to fit them both. Big Boy 4014 eventually ended up having to borrow the 3985's tender, as there wasn't enough time to have its original tender converted from coal to oil in time for the Golden Spike 150 anniversary. In addition, the steam team also had to contend with giving the A44 a much-needed overhaul in 2015, as its annual FRA-mandated 15-year inspection drew close. Not only to have at least one operating steam locomotive in their roster, but also to keep up the living legend's reputation as the only steam locomotive on a Class 1 railroad to never be retired. Big Boy 4014's restoration would be completed when it ran under its own power for the first time in nearly 60 years, making its first run from Cheyenne to Nunn, Colorado. Then after that, there was its very first excursion out to Ogden, Utah along with the A44 for the 150 Golden Spike celebration. However, around that time, the thought of restoring Heavy Challenger number 3985 back to steam again had changed considerably. Ed Dickens, the steam team, and even Union Pacific themselves felt that keeping two steam locomotives operable was enough for them to handle, and that trying to maintain and operate three would be a bit too much, especially considering the poor mechanical condition the 3985 was in, as well as the necessary funds and manpower needed to give the big boy smaller sibling an extensive overhaul if it was ever to steam again. And so, on January 2nd, 2020, Ed Dickens finally announced that Union Pacific Heavy Challenger number 3985 was officially retired from excursion service, and that Big Boy 4014 had become its official replacement. Now retired from active service, the 3985 simply sat undisturbed in its stall at the Roundhouse in Cheyenne. Once facing a promising future, from that point onward, it seemed most likely that the Heavy Challenger would never steam again. Or so we thought. Earlier this year, on the 28th of April, Union Pacific had officially announced that they would be donating several pieces of their equipment from their heritage fleet to the railroading heritage of Midwest America based in Silvis, Illinois, where they plan to restore and operate around their area. Among the pieces of equipment donated to the group are EMD DDA 40X Centennial Diesel number 6936, their unpowered E9B unit, Triple T 6 Class 2102 Santa Fe number 5511, and most important of all, Heavy Challenger number 3985. As of the making of this video, the 3985 and 5511 have still yet to be moved out to their new home in Illinois. But even so, the RRHMA had already set up a fundraiser back on May 13th to have both former Union Pacific steam locomotives restored back to operational condition. Up to this point, they have already managed to raise almost one-third of their main goal of $1,500,000 towards the 5511 and 3985 return to steam. It's currently unknown how much longer it'll be before the RRHMA reaches its fundraiser goal, nor when they plan to start the restoration for the CUP giant and how long it'll take before it returns to service. However, one thing that is known for sure is that this heavy challenger will be the very first locomotive the railroading heritage of Midwest America will restore back to steam. In addition, the RRHMA will also be restoring Big Boy 4014's actual tender, which also includes converting it to oil. Once this is complete, both tenders will be returned to their original owners. 
Although the 3985 will be brought back to life almost 750 miles, as the crow flies, away from the place it's called home for so many decades, hopefully once it's back on the rails again, it'll have a chance to run alongside its bigger brother. Whether the 4014 travels up to where the 3985 will operate, or if the large Challenger gets the chance to run on some old familiar stomping grounds on the UP system. If the RRHMA is able to operate that far, that is. Now, this may be just the rail fan in me talking, but one thing I would like to see sometime after the 3985 has returned to steam would be an epic triple header between this engine, the 844, and Big Boy 4014. Just imagine what that would be like. These two enormous titans of the rails and the living legend all together powering one single long train without any diesel assistance, be it either a long excursion passenger train or even a long heavy freight train. Now that would be quite a sight to see. After all, like Steve Lee said back during the Challenger's 1993 excursion, We always wanted to run a triple header. <laughs> And hopefully, as long as there is a good partnership between Union Pacific and the railroading heritage of Midwest America, that little common he made nearly 30 years ago could possibly become a reality. But whether or not this will ever happen, it'll still be good to see the 3985 back in action again after more than 10 years. And although it'll no longer bear the title as the world's largest active steam locomotive, this is still one giant that many look forward to seeing return to steam once again. And now, the closest spot with a bit of a fun fact. Did you know that Hank, from season 12 of Thomas and Friends, was first planned to be based off of the Heavy Challengers? That's right, in an early design made by Philip Reeves, the senior designer for the series from 2005 to 2008, it shows that Hank was originally planned to be based off of Union Pacific's Heavy Challengers, which not only would have made him the first American engine on Sodor, if you don't count Rosie that is, but also the largest, as well as the very first articulated engine on the island as well. However, for some reason, possibly because they consider his proposed design to be a bit too large for their film sets or something similar, this design ended up being dropped, which led to Hank being based off of the Pennsylvania Railroad K4 Pacific, still making him the first American engine in the series. While Sam later on in 2014 and 2015 during the CGI era became the first articulated engine as well as the largest. Now, I bet I know what you're wondering. If Union Pacific number 3985 didn't make the number one spot on my list, then what did? Well, there is one particular steam locomotive that does come to my mind. But before we get to that, first, let's have a look at this list's honorable mentions. Those being Chesapeake and Ohio, Kanawa number 2716, mainly because this engine has already been covered plenty of times on other people's lists. Nickel Play Row number 759, the Reading T1 Northerns, namely numbers 2100, 2101, and 2124. I wanted to include these engines on my list as well, but since number 2102 has returned to steam earlier this year, it wouldn't be quite the same as it was on previous top lists for retired steam excursion stars other YouTubers have done. I might feature this class in a future video though. London and Southwestern Railway Adams Radial Tank number 488, Savannah and Atlanta number 750, Clinchfield 10 Wheeler number 1, all the retired Canadian Pacific 462 Pacifics numbers 1201, 1238, 1278, 1286, 1293, and 2317, the three British 422 singles, Great Northern Railway Sterling Single number 1, Caledonian Railway number 123, and Midland Railway Johnson Spinner number 673, the Western and Atlantic's General, Norfolk and Western number 578, Grand Trunk Western number 4070, Grand Trunk Western or Ohio Central number 6325, Atlanta and West Point number 290, Louisville and Nashville number 152, Great Western Railway City Class number 3440, City of Truro, Virginia and Trucking number 12, Genoa, Union Pacific 060 Switcher number 4466, Atchison, Topeka and Santa Fe number 1316, aka Texas State Railroad number 500, Southern Railway number 722, LNER Peppercorn A2 number 60532, Blue Peter, Reading Railroad Camelback number 1187, aka Strasburg Railroad number 4, 
Texas and Pacific, number 610, RJ Corman QJ, number 2007, or former China Railways QJ, number 4070, and finally, and this may come as a surprise to some, Japanese National Railway C62, number 3. Well, with all that out of the way, we now finally come to the number one spot of my top 17 retired steam excursion stars. Canadian Pacific Railway number 2816. Wasn't expecting this, were ya? For the number one spot on my list, I've chosen the Canadian Pacific Railway's H1B Class 464 Hudson number 2816, otherwise known as the Empress. Built back in December of 1930 by Montreal Locomotive Works in Montreal, Quebec in Canada. Now, as I mentioned back in part 2 of my list, the 2816 is one of 5 preserved 464 Hudsons from the CPR. However, while the 4 other surviving engines are of the semi-streamlined Royal Hudsons, number 2816 is the sole surviving non-streamlined Hudson from Canadian Pacific. The railroad's first 20 non-streamlined Hudsons were built by Montreal between 1929 and 1930, with the first 10 classified as the H1As, number 2800 to 2809, and the remaining half classified as the H1Bs, number 2810 to 2819. The first 20 CPR Hudsons operated express trains throughout the Canadian Pacific system. The 2816 in particular was first assigned to passenger work between Winnipeg, Manitoba and Fort William, Ontario. Later on, it would be transferred to work on the route between Windsor, Ontario and Quebec City. At one point during its time in service, the engine wore a pair of large elephant ear smoke deflectors along with a few other members of its class. At some other point, it had also swapped its tender with that of H1C class number 2822, which it still carries to this day. The engine's last assignment was operating a commuter train between Montreal and Rigaud, Quebec, before being retired from active service on May 28, 1960, having traveled more than 2 million miles. Unlike the rest of its non-streamlined siblings, number 2816 was safe and scrapped when it was purchased from Canadian Pacific in 1964 by F. Nelson Blount for his Steentown USA collection in Bells Falls, Vermont. Interesting fact, Blount at first wanted to preserve a different 464 steam locomotive, the one he originally had in mind being one of the famous New York Central Hudsons. However, since all of these engines had unfortunately been scrapped by that time, he then improvised by purchasing the 2816, making it the only Hudson type in his Steamtown collection. The 2816 resided in Bellows Falls for the next 20 years, until being moved along with the rest of the collection to their new home in Scranton, Pennsylvania in 1984, which of course eventually became Steamtown National Historic Site in 1986. Following another 12 years residing in Pennsylvania, in September 1998, the former CPR Hudson was purchased by the very company it once served nearly 40 years ago, Canadian Pacific. The CP had found out about their former non-streamlined Hudson's availability from the crews that operated Royal Hudson No. 2860. They were in need of some new parts for the 2860 around that time. So when they inquired Steamtown about obtaining the necessary parts from number 2816 for the Royal Hudson, they offered them the whole locomotive. So the old 1930 built Hudson was shipped out from Scranton, Pennsylvania all the way out to Montreal, Quebec, Canada, via Binghamton to Albany, New York, back in its home country after almost 35 years. After which, it was then transported cross-country to the BC Rail Steam Shops in Vancouver for restoration. During its overhaul, the old Canadian Pacific Hudson was converted from burning coal to oil and was given a few modern upgrades, such as a radio for easier communication and a diesel control unit, in order to control diesel locomotives from the cab of number 2816. 
This restoration also involved having the boiler transported south to Portland, Oregon, where it was restored at the old Brooklyn Roundhouse. The original home of Oregon Railroad and Navigation Company, 462 Pacific, number 197, Spokane, Portland, and Seattle, 484 Northern, number 700, and the pride of their collection, Southern Pacific GS4 Streamline Northern, number 4449 better known to everyone as the Daylight, before they were moved to their new home at the Oregon Rail Heritage Center in 2012. In addition, the 2816's driving wheels were transported all the way out to the Tennessee Valley Railroad Museum in Chattanooga, Tennessee to be restored as well. Work on the old Canadian 464 Hudson took more than two years to complete, with a price tag of more than $2 million. Again, don't know if this is in US dollars or Canadian dollars making it one of the most expensive locomotive restorations in Canada. The 2816's restoration was eventually completed on August 16, 2001, running under its own power for the first time in more than 40 years. About one month later, in September of that year, it made its very first run from the BC Rail Steam Shops in Vancouver all the way out to its new home at Canadian Pacific's main headquarters in Calgary. From there, the 2816 had once again become part of the Canadian Pacific roster as a special excursion locomotive and public relations asset. Over the next 11 years between 2001 and 2012, the Empress operated a number of excursions throughout Canada and even operated a few times in the United States. Some of the trips number 2816 has done over the years include hitting two trips on the West Coast Express between Port Coquitlam and Mission British Columbia in mid-May of 2002, a doubleheader with Canadian National 280 Consolidation number 2141, otherwise known as the Spirit of Kamloops, on the Kamloops Heritage Railway in Kamloops, British Columbia back in 2003, and a series of trips south of the Canadian border through the states of Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Illinois between between August and September of 2007, which also includes a double header with Milwaukee Road number 261. The only time the 2816 didn't run during its excursion career was in 2009, when Canadian Pacific had temporarily halted the steam program due to the poor economy in Canada at the time. However, while it didn't get to run during this time, the men in charge of the steam program did take this time as an opportunity to do some extensive maintenance work on the engine, as well as the program's passenger cars. The 2816 would return the steam the following year, on June 6, 2010. The following year, the old Canadian Pacific Hudson would hit the big time, when the Empress herself became the star of Stephen Lowe's IMAX documentary film, Rocky Mountain Express. The film featured several stunning helicopter and gyro stabilizer shots of the 2816 as it traveled along the CP main line between Vancouver and Montreal, all while the narrator told the history of the Canadian Pacific Railway. Filming for this special documentary took about five years to complete, starting back in 2006 with the cooperation of Canadian Pacific. I also got to see this movie myself a few years ago at the IMAX theater inside the Clark Planetarium in Salt Lake City, and it really is a great film. However, come late 2012 the following year, the 2816's excursion career suddenly came to an abrupt end when Fred Green stepped down as CEO of Canadian Pacific and was replaced by... HIM! This here is E. Hunter Harrison, former CEO of Canadian Pacific between late June 2012 and mid-January 2017, or as I like to refer to him as the Dr. Beeching of Canadian Pacific. Harrison had also been previously CEO of the Illinois Central Railroad in 1993, then later Canadian National following its merger with the IC in 1988, before eventually taking charge of the CPR in 2012. Then, after resigning from the CP, he then later became CEO of CSX back in the US from March up until his death in December of 2017. A few unwanted changes occurred during Harrison's time on the Canadian Pacific, one of which being once he took charge of the railroad, he immediately ended the steam program and forced the 2816 to retire from service as he saw absolutely no value in railroad preservation and heritage. To say that this came as a shock to the Canadian rail fan community would be an understatement.
Because of this, the 2816 was placed in storage in Calgary, along with many other pieces of their heritage equipment. Although the engine was no longer in service, no thanks to Harrison, at least it was safely stored indoors and looked after by employees or volunteers. But even so, many suspected around that time that with Harrison at the helm, the railroad steam program was over for good. Eventually, Harrison, thankfully, retired from being CEO of Canadian Pacific in early 2017, and Keith Creel became his successor. Creel set out fixing up much of the damage from Harrison's time on the CP, proving to be a much better president for the railroad than Harrison ever was. He was even named Railroader of the Year by Railway Age magazine, twice in fact, last year in 2021 and earlier this year in 2022. But even so, the 2816 still remained in storage in Calgary, and the question of whether or not the engine would ever return to excursion service still remained uncertain. The old Canadian Hudson did get the steam up momentarily in November 2020 as part of a steam test, mainly moving around the Calgary yards to assess the locomotive's mechanical condition. It even got to take part in a special virtual Holiday Train from Home concert, since the actual Canadian Pacific Holiday Train didn't get to run that year due to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, there were no initial plans to have the engine return to the main line. Until now. Earlier this year, Canadian Pacific has been attempting the merge with the Kansas City Southern Railway, which has operated since 1887 and runs between the Midwestern and Southeastern United States, and even over the U.S.-Mexican border down in the Mexico, going as far down south as the port of Lazaro Cardenas. Sorry if I didn't pronounce that correctly. I don't know much of the details about this merger, but what I do know is that if it is approved by the U.S. Surface Transportation Board, it will become the only railroad to serve the three biggest countries in North America, running through Canada, the United States, and Mexico. To help celebrate the merger once it's complete, the railroad plans to bring the Empress herself back to steam again, and have the old CP Hudson operate a special long-distance excursion from Calgary more than 2,300 miles all the way down to Mexico City, which will make it the very first steam locomotive to operate through Canada, the US, and Mexico. It'll be kind of like when Flying Scotsman made its tours throughout the US and Canada in the late 60s and early 70s, and across Australia in 1988. Only, the 2816 won't need to be transported on any ships for this one. It was also announced that the 2816 would begin its tour sometime in early 2023, which just so happens to be only a few short months from now. However, before this can happen, the locomotive is currently undergoing a complete overhaul to ensure it's in tip-top condition to make such a run. I'm pretty sure plenty of rail fans are looking forward to the day when this classic Canadian locomotive is brought back to life once again. And I'll bet it'll be quite a journey for this engine as it travels thousands of miles from Calgary all the way down to Mexico City, making its way across Canada, the United States, and Mexico. Its place as the sole surviving non-streamlined member of its class, its time at Steamtown as the only Hudson type in its collection until being brought back to Canada for restoration, its starring role in Rocky Mountain Express in 2011, its forced retirement by Harrison in 2012, and its potential return to glory the following year from now are the main reasons why the Canadian Pacific Railway number 2816 holds the number one spot in my top 17 retired steam excursion stars. there you have it ladies and gentlemen after a few long months i finally managed to finish up my top 17 retired steam excursion stars 
sorry it took me this long to finally wrap up this list. It was all mainly due to a combination of a few problems while making this video, and other things going on in my life, as well as a bit of laziness on my part. But even so, I hope it was all worth it in the end, and I hope you all enjoyed watching. Let me know what you thought about this list, and if there are any other retired Steam Excursion stars I haven't covered on here that come to your mind, let me know down in the comments below. I'll see what I'll come up with for my next project for this channel. But until next time, have a good day, or night or whenever you're watching this, and happy railroading!